Well, good morning, Walden Church. This Sunday, today, is typically called Palm Sunday. And it is the Sunday that all creation has been waiting for. In fact, this is the one we have been waiting for since we began this study in the book of Matthew at Christmas time. Because in December, we all witnessed a baby that was born. And at that time, wise men came in answer to a prophecy. Ancient texts that they read said that on that day, at that time, a savior would be born. And so they traveled. They went based on faith. They went based on trust. And they found that prophecy. They found that prophecy alive in the flesh. And when they did, they bowed down and they worshiped that baby. Now we're in Matthew chapter 21. And that baby is all grown up. And they are about to fulfill prophecy once again. In fact, Jesus is going to fulfill several prophecies. And we're going to look at those. But make no mistake, this is the beginning of the end. Over the next eight days, Jesus will cleanse the temple. He will confront the religious leaders. He will share Passover with his disciples. He'll be arrested, he will be betrayed, he'll be tried, killed, and resurrected. And just like his birth, this week was planned before the beginning of the world. In fact, it was promised to Adam and Eve in the garden. And even now, as we stand, distant and so far removed from this story, it is still relevant and this story is still needed in your life. Why? Because Jesus is your king. Matthew 21 verse 1 says, Now they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethage, to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them and he will send them at once. This is the beginning. And I wanna to talk to you how this whole chapter reveals to you and to all of us, to the world, that Jesus is your king. Jesus is making a triumphal entry into Jerusalem as king. And Matthew wants to show you what kind of king he is. First, he is a divine king. He is a divine king. How so? Because everything seems to happen as if by magic, right? It, it's exactly how it's supposed to be, exactly how Jesus said. Everything is where Jesus said. It goes according to plan. He says, do this, follow that. Should anyone ask you? And if anyone should ask you, what should you say? The Lord has need of it. Now, Generally speaking, Lord is someone with authority, control, someone with power over others. However, after the resurrection, that title, the Lord, is applied only to Jesus. And it becomes more of a title of honor and respect. Saying, Jesus is Lord, became a way of declaring Jesus and his deity, his messiahship. And it begins with Thomas when he affirms Jesus after he appears at the resurrection. Thomas says to him, my Lord and my God, when he touches the wound in his side. And from then on, the apostles' message as they preach, as they proclaim the gospel, as they begin the church is Jesus is Lord. Verse 4 and 5 says, this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. So there we see that he is a prophesied king. And if you follow your footnote in your own Bible and you drag your finger all the way down to the bottom of the page, it's going to point you to an Old Testament verse. Okay, That's a prophecy that was made 500 years before Jesus was born. So after the exile, the Hebrews began to rebuild their city. It had been conquered 
They had been pulled out of their homeland, and now they're back, they're rebuilding, they're rebuilding the temple, they're rebuilding the wall, and that's the same wall that Jesus is now going through right now. And Zechariah, way back when, 500 years ago, stands on that wall and he says, I know the kings of the past that we've had have failed us. They haven't been the greatest kings. But he says, rejoice, because a new king is coming. And that's happening right now. Zechariah 9.9, the prophecy, says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you righteous, and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 500 years before Jesus, this prophecy, a king and a donkey will come through the wall of Jerusalem. Can you see it? It's all planned, all prophesied, all ordained. Zechariah 9 also says that he is a righteous king. All the kings of the past, all of them, even David, even Solomon, they had flaws, they had sins, they were not perfect. They didn't completely save. Jesus is a savior king. He is a salvation bringing, perfect king, and that makes him righteous. When the crowds see Jesus and they shout, Hosanna, that means save us. Save us, why? Well, because they know this prophecy. The people know this prophecy from Zechariah. They know the prophecy, and they know that they are living in this moment right now. They are seeing it with their own eyes. A 500-year-old prophecy coming true right in front of them. Zechariah also says that he will be a gentle king, right? Gentle. He comes humble. He is not a monarch. He is not a tyrant who throws his weight around. He is not riding on a white stallion, or he's not, you know, in a parade. He's not in a chariot. The people who go before him are children, and they're waving palm branches. He is not in ornamental robes. His, his trumpets are only the voices of the people. You know, many people expected, even hoped, that he would come, that he would liberate all of them from Rome. And he is a liberator. But over the next eight days, he's going to bring that salvation gently. In fact, he's riding into town, basically, to surrender himself. And he's going to do it without a fight. If you keep reading the next verse in Zechariah, you also see that he is a peaceful king. Zechariah 9.10 says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. You know, if a king were going to go to war, he would ride a horse. But if it was a time of peace, a king would ride a donkey. So make no mistake, Jesus enters into an arena. He does. He enters into the arena, but he is not going to war against humanity. He's not going to war against the Jews or Rome or the synagogue. The first clue that this triumphal entry probably isn't going to go as everyone thinks is that Jesus rides in humility. He rides in peace. Verse 10 of Zechariah also says that he is a global king. Verse 10 says, He shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. You know, Christianity and following Jesus. This is not an American religion. Jesus is not an American savior. I know we always say, God bless America, and he does. But the focus of Jesus is bigger than that. His grace is bigger. His forgiveness is bigger. His love is bigger. Jesus came to save the world. Really, it's, it's God saved the world, right? Jesus has sovereign reign over all. Verse 10 says it's from sea to sea. Jesus is king over me. Jesus is king over you and, and, and over everyone else, even if they don't believe in him. Jesus is king even over those who would curse him. Now, we go back to our story here in Matthew. We see that he is also a messianic king. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. Verse 7 says they brought the donkey and the colt and put them on their cloaks and he sat on them. 
Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the ground, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. All the people are shouting and they know exactly who Jesus is, that he is from the line of David, which means from, from a line of kings, and they are shouting, Messiah, Messiah, save us. Hosanna is often translated as, please save us. It's, it's a Greek word that comes from two Hebrew words, yasha, which means save or, or deliver, and anna, which means please, please save. The, the people who are celebrating his arrival into Jerusalem, they're shouting out a Bible verse. They're shouting out Psalm 118, which says, Save us, we pray. O Lord, O Lord, we pray. Give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So just like the little baby Jesus and how the wise men went in search of him, he was, he was long awaited. His birth was long awaited. Jesus now fulfills another prophecy. He is, he is the king of prophecy. And, and the wait for this king to arrive is over. He is prophesied and he is also prophet. Jesus is also a prophet king. And he's the perfect prophet. Why is he a prophet? Well, because a prophet speaks for God. A prophet speaks with God's voice. When the, the things that the prophet says come from God, and the Bible says right away, very first line in the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then following that verse, in verse 14, it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ is God incarnate, God the Son, and he came to fulfill this prophecy and this promise of a, of a tactile relationship. Jesus comes as a physical prophet, a physical word of God, not just with a group of people, not just with lepers, not just with centurions, not just with slaves, not just with the Gentiles, not just with women, but with you and me. He came to be all of our great prophet. Let's look at another prophecy from a, from a different book. This time uh, we'll go over to Malachi. Malachi says that he is a holy king, Malachi 3, 1 says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. The word holy means that he is exalted or worthy of complete devotion as one who's perfect in goodness, perfect in righteousness, set apart right? The priests were supposed to be holy. The temple was supposed to be holy. The items in the temple, the vestments, the tools, all of it was supposed to be holy, sacred, set apart for God. But another prophecy written 400 years before Jesus says, this king will come and he will visit the temple and he will purify the temple. The temple will be cleansed. It'll become a holy place once again. It has ceased to be the Father's house. And so to make it holy once again, one holier than the temple has to come and clean it. Does Jesus do that? Yes, he does. In fact, it's the very next thing he does. Matthew 21 verse 12 says, Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables and the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, 
but you have made it a den of robbers. The temple now, in Jesus' day, is more like a, an airport and less like a church. People are buying and selling and stealing from other people. And Jesus now fulfills Malachi's words, and he cleanses the temple, cleanses it from hypocrisy, cleanses it from shallow worship. And as he does this, he shouts out Isaiah chapter 56, my house is a house of prayer. And he shouts out the book of Jeremiah, you have made it a den of robbers. The outer court where all these tables are was a place of worship. It was supposed to be for Gentiles, for women, and for those with illness and brokenness, for broken limbs or the infirm. But instead, it had become a mini mall for crooks. And Jesus is angry. Angry like we saw last week when he confronts the Pharisees. Jesus is not going to tolerate false worship. He is a holy king. And if that's the case, then when we come to this place, when you go to your church, you, you are singing to a holy king. You are singing to a king who has been set apart. And, and if that's the case, then we should be mindful of that. You know, when we throw our money into the offering plate, we have to do it with worship. When we sing our songs, we do it with worship. When we listen to the lesson, we do it as worship. We cannot casually go through the motions. These people that were out in the lobby of the synagogue in the temple, they were, they were too casual. They were mistreating the temple. Jesus says, this is my father's house. We can all get caught up in being too casual about worship, not placing the emphasis on being in the presence of a holy God, worshiping a holy God, making all of this about a holy God and not us. We are all his. This church is his. He, he is a holy God and we are a holy priesthood. I'm sure those tables out there in the outer court, I'm sure they didn't just spring up overnight. You know, I'm sure it all started with one. One table. And that person was probably honest, doing the right thing. And it all began with good intentions. And just over time, it, we, just, we, we just get lazy, right? A years passed and we, we just stopped caring as much. And it's happened to us too, even, even these past few years that we've gone through with, with COVID and the lockdown. I would suggest that we have all got a little lazy. We have let our guard down more and more. Easter is next week. Easter is next week. Good Friday is this Friday. Easter, arguably the most important date on the Christian calendar. We, we cannot be lazy any longer. In John 2.18, the priests rush out and they ask him, why are you flipping over these tables, right? The Bible verse says, what sign do you show us for doing these things? As if to ask what? Hey, what gives you the right to do this? How come you're doing this? By what authority are you doing this? Ladies and gentlemen, we have come full circle. If you remember, in our fourth week together, looking at the book of Matthew, when Jesus first began to teach, the Bible says of him in Matthew 7, when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. He taught with God's authority. Remember, he is God's prophet right? So he teaches with God's authority. And then Matthew 8, the very next chapter, shows you that Jesus heals the centurion's daughter. So then he heals with God's authority. He speaks with God's authority. He heals with God's authority. And in that same chapter, he casts out demons. And Matthew shows you that Jesus has authority over the spiritual world. In fact, the Christmas story, even at, at the very beginning the Christmas story begins with a very famous verse. 
Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. There's your authority. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come full circle. The God-man is here. The one who speaks and acts as God is here. Hey, what do you mean? What do you, what do you mean by whose authority do I do these things? My own. My own. Why don't, you, why don't you go back into the back room back there and check the lease on this place? Because all of this is mine. This is my house. I know it sounds harsh. And I know it sounds angry. But if you notice, Jesus does not throw everyone out. He doesn't throw everyone out because he is also a loving king. Verse 14 says, And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. He doesn't drive everyone out. In fact, he shows love and compassion to his children. And this will be his only healing over the next eight days in Jerusalem. This is the last the last of the healing. Jesus hears the cry of his children and he doesn't ignore it, right? He does not ignore the cries of the oppressed. And Jesus makes a promise that one day when we go to live with him in heaven, there'll be no more crying, no more, de no more death, right? Notice at the end of verse 15, the children are now running through the temple. Children are now running through the temple, mimicking the words they heard out on the street, and they are shouting that Jesus is the God King. He is God, the God King. Hosanna to the Son of David. And the priests are indignant, right? They're indignant. Why? Because it's blasphemy. It's blasphemy. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. The priests say, stop those kids from saying that. That's blasphemy. They're calling you God. They're calling you the Messiah. And Jesus says, no, it's not blasphemy. Right? It's not blasphemy because I am. And he quotes Psalm 8. It's a song we sing in church. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. Here, here is the beautiful thing, okay? And, and, and don't miss this. That psalm is about God, all right? And it's about God receiving praise. And Jesus says, I'm not going to stop those children because they're singing about me. Why did the religious leaders want to kill Jesus? This is why. All right, he storms into the temple. He flips tables. And when the priests ask him how it is that he can do this, and by whose authority that he has, he says, my own. I'm God. This is my house. Oh yeah, and those kids that are singing over there, they're singing about me and they're worshiping me because I'm God. And then Jesus drops the mic, he goes outside, and he kills a tree. <laughs> it's true. That's what happens. Verse 17 says, And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. In the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the tree withered at once. When the disciples saw it, they marveled saying, how did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answered, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, 
But even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Why does Jesus kill a tree? Why does Jesus kill a tree? Well, think about the story that took place right before it. A temple that, from the outside, looks like it's healthy, looks like it produces fruit, looks like it produces life, that it worships God, but inside it was dead and lifeless. And Jesus said, this temple is not true. It, it no longer serves its purpose. It is functionless. So Jesus kills the fig tree as a way of saying, he has power, he has authority, and there's no room for false, shallow, hypocritical religion. Jesus shows up, and that fig tree better make figs. So there's two sides of this coin. Yes, there is the triumphal entry. Jesus comes in peace. He comes to rescue sinners. He comes to surrender and be crucified. So that makes him a suffering king, right? Because he doesn't, he doesn't come to conquer Rome or to deliver Israel from Rome. He does come to deliver all people from sea to sea, but from sin. But the other side of this coin is this king is coming back again. And when he comes back, he won't be riding a donkey. And it won't be a time of peace. If you go all the way to the back of the Bible, Revelation 19, John records, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is also a prophecy, but it is not a prophecy that is behind us. This is a prophecy that is out in front of us. This is a prophecy that is ahead of us. And we now look forward to it, those words saying that one day Jesus will return and this time he will be on a horse and he'll be riding towards war. The second coming. The first company coming was on a donkey, it was in peace. Jesus laid down his life, gave his life. He, ro he rode into town and he surrendered his life without a fight. But in the second coming, he does not come to save or rescue. He already came to save sinners. The good news is here. The kingdom is here. The salva salvation has come. That is the good news. You live in the era, you live in the age of good news right now. But at the second coming, Jesus comes in power. The first coming was to be crucified. The second coming is to be crowned. Jesus is the king. Have you confessed that? Have you confessed that Jesus is the king? Let's not play around, all right? Let's not be frivolent or, or lazy. Let's not play church right now. Listen, every atheist, every agnostic will believe at the second coming. The Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But that day is too late. That day is too late. Today is the day to humble your heart. Today is the day to surrender your life. 
1 Corinthians 29 says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. There is a true story about the explorer, Sir Ernest Shackleton. During one of his expeditions to the Antarctic, he left some of his men on Elephant Island in the Antarctic with the intent of returning. He said, I will return and I will get you and I will take you back to England. But he was delayed. And by the time he could go back for them, the sea had frozen and he didn't have any access to get to the island. He tried three times to reach them and every single time the ice stopped him. And finally on the fourth try, he was able to break through the ice and travel on a very narrow channel of water. Well, much to his surprise, when he got there, he found the crewmen all waiting for him. Their supplies were packed and they were ready to get on board. And they were soon right back on their way to England. And he asked them, how did you know to be ready for me today? And they told him, we didn't know. We were just ready every day. Every morning, the captain rolled up his bag, packed his gear, and told the crew, Get your things ready. The boss may come today. And if they hadn't been prepared, they might not have been able to escape the dangerous ice. But they were ready. Matthew 24, 44 says, Therefore you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. One chapter later, Jesus says, Watch therefore, for you neither know the day or the hour. Church, the world outside makes us lazy. It does. These past few years especially, COVID has made us all lazy. Even in the church, hasn't it felt like everything's just kind of been on autopilot, directionless, motionless? Easter is next week. So that ends. That ends. Listen, it only takes one moment to be saved, but it will take a lifetime to live as a follower, to live as one who was saved. And we do, we get dulled, we get dulled by the cares of this world, we get dulled and lazy by the problems of this world, like money and relationships and health and jobs and stress. And and even though when we accepted Jesus, we were, we were super serious back then, and we said, I'm going to live for Jesus. Something changes over the years, and we lose our readiness. And we become like the guy who gets caught sleeping at his desk when the boss walks by and taps him and says, hey, why aren't you working? And the employee says, yeah, because I didn't see you coming. God has not left us a stopwatch to let us know the exact moment that he will return. He could show up at any time. In another part of the Bible, when Jesus kills the fig tree in that story, the gospel writer of that story says, well, it wasn't, it wasn't the time for figs. It wasn't the time for figs. It wasn't the tree's fault. Guess what? Didn't matter to Jesus. The excuse didn't matter. When Jesus comes on the white horse, what do you want him to catch you doing? Whatever it is, that's what we should be doing. Jonathan Edwards, he was the figurehead for the Great Awakening in North America. He made a long list of resolutions that he read read every single week. And resolution number seven says... I resolve never to do anything which I would be afraid to do if it were the last hour of my life. Jesus is coming again and he will be crowned the ultimate victor. He will be crowned the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the Bible says he is not the only one who will get a crown that day. 2 Timothy 4.8 says you will get a crown. Now there is a store for me, the crown of righteousness, 
which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. I hope you are longing for the second triumphal entry, the second coming. I hope that you are waiting. I hope that you are yearning. I hope that you are anticipating his arrival every day. Let his coming be motivation for all that you do. Because you are not forgotten. You are not unseen. The little things that you do, whether they're in your house or your community, your church, it is noticed. It has meaning. Your faith will be rewarded. The return of the king will set everything right. He will fix every situation and he will put the world back together again. The same way Jesus cleansed the temple and made it holy. When Jesus returns, he will set and cleanse the earth and make it holy. Are you ready? Are you ready? Even if you were once ready, are you ready today? Or have you grown weary and tired and have you let the little things distract you? If you've been putting it off, I would strongly encourage you not to. If you've been lazy about church, lazy about serving, lazy about forgiving, lazy about loving, let's give our cheeks a couple slaps and shake off the drowsiness and grab a tall cup of coffee and roll up our sleeves and grab a palm branch. Get your things ready, crew. The boss may be coming today. But if you haven't yet made that promise, if you've never said that prayer, I would also encourage you, don't wait. Don't wait one more day. Don't even wait another hour. Your king loves you, and he wants you to be with him forever. If you have waited to say yes to Jesus, then I would invite you to bow your heads and say this prayer with me. Dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus so I could be your friend. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being with me all my life, even when I didn't know it. I realize I need a savior to set me free from sin, from myself and from all the habits and hurts and hangups that mess up my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I wanna repent and live the way you created me to live. Be the Lord of my life. Save me with your grace. I wanna to learn to love you and trust you and become everything that you've made me to be. Thank you for creating me and choosing me to be a part of your family. Amen. Well, that is our Palm Sunday service, but I wanna remind you that this Friday, we will also have services. So this Friday, we have a single service at 6.30. It'll be a more somber service. We won't have anything for kids. Everything will be here in the sanctuary. Uh, we're gonna look at the cross. We're gonna talk about crucifixion. We're gonna share communion, and that will prepare us for Easter morning. Now Sunday, on Easter morning, we will have three services, one at 7 a.m., and that'll be at the Yacht Club flagpole. So the Yacht Club flagpole, it'll be dark when you arrive. <laughs> That's just how it is. But over the course of the hour, as we sing and as we praise God and we welcome in the morning, we will see the sun rise over the lake. It's beautiful. If you want to bring your own chair or bring a blanket, go for it. Uh, lots of people do. And so that's just, it's just part of the morning. And like I said, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful service. Uh, the next two services will be here in the church. We'll have our standard 9.30 service and our 11 o'clock service. And uh, both hours will be completely identical. And we will also have an Easter egg hunt, both hours, 9.30 and 11, for the kids. And uh, we'd just love to see you. We'd love to be the church where you live. Thanks, guys, for watching. I'll see you guys soon. Bye.